Signs of gun violence are ubiquitous in the 4-0, which has some of the highest rates of shootings and of gun seizures in the city. Bullet holes pock walls in the area's projects and the doors of some all-night bodegas. On the sidewalks, wounded men in the prime of life walk with canes or ride in wheelchairs. Gunshots at night are not uncommon in and around the Mott Haven and Patterson projects, residents say. So many shootings between warring crews have occurred along East 143rd Street near 3rd Avenue, the nexus between the two developments, that the police have raised extra lights and an observation tower with cameras. You have to have a gun to protect yourself, said one of Capone's friends. It's the norm. For decades, firearms have been transported to New York from southern states with lenient gun laws, like Virginia and North Carolina, but ATF agents say they are now seeing more pistols arriving from Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania and Ohio. Guns produce money in New York, a pistol bought for $200 out of state can go for $700 on Brook Avenue in the Bronx. But unlike many drug dealers, gun runners tend to rely on personal connections and rarely sell in the open. New Yorkers visiting relatives in Virginia or Ohio, for instance, may take orders from people they know and buy guns at pawn shops, at sporting goods stores, at gun shows, or from private sellers, then haul them back, often on economy buses run out of Chinatown. The sales are sometimes arranged on social media. The firearms remain in circulation for decades, being resold again and again, studies show. Some are kept by street gangs as community weapons, stashed in mailboxes, trash cans or the wheel wells of cars, available to use at a moment's notice, the official said. In 2015, about 3,674 guns were recovered in the city, with 89% of them originating in other states, according to the state attorney general's office. The Bronx had the most guns recovered per capita in the city, with 902, or 62 for every 100,000 residents. Brooklyn was close behind, with 55 for every 100,000. The South Bronx and Northern Brooklyn are also where two-thirds to three-quarters of the city's shootings take place. A 30-year-old man who helps run a heroin dealing operation in the 40th precinct said that procuring a gun was simple. I can walk down the street and buy a gun right now, said the dealer, who spoke on the condition that he not be identified by name. It's probably used. It's probably got a body. Somebody's going to sell it to you. Now today, in 2022, crime has risen, and the shooters, as well as the victims, are getting younger. So, this is a quick side story. The two we will talk about today is Capone and Biggie. So, these two were living emblems of the ravages of gun violence in the South Bronx. Capone found trouble with striking regularity, despite being in a wheelchair since a bullet hit his spine two decades earlier. He was much older than Biggie, about 12 year older. Biggie had been shot twice before and carried two slugs in his body from the first attack. It happened in 2011, when he took eight bullets to the torso. One weekend, the men came face to face in the Mott Haven houses. Capone, 39, rolled his wheelchair into a small fenced courtyard where a birthday party was in progress. For who? Doesn't matter. He was accompanied by his brother, D, and three friends. That day he was rocking a pair of glasses and a black bubble-type vest. He could be easily identified by his hair, dreadlocks, which was a common look for Capone at this time. Biggie, 28, rose too to meet them. It was about 1.50 a.m. on Sunday, October 23, 2017. Biggie stood around 6 foot 3 and weighed about 300 pounds. He was a force and could put you out with ease if needed be. A mammoth of a man in the hood, most knew they couldn't beat him, and the average guy would stand a chance. To those that knew him, he was a gentle giant. Biggie had been expecting trouble for weeks before October 23. He had told his mother that Capone and his brother might be looking for him because he had beaten up their uncle. Capone and Biggie had long arrest records on charges including crack dealing and gun possession. Both had served time in prison. Both had been suspects in other shootings. Both were feared figures in the Mott Haven houses and the nearby Patterson houses, projects notorious for gun violence and feuds between street gangs. They grew up in a pocket of the city of washing guns, brought to New York a few at a time, on buses and cars, most of them from states with weaker gun laws, and sold for a hefty profit. The guns are used not only in crimes like robbery and drug dealing, but also in a struggle for respect in some of the city's most impoverished neighborhoods. That Sunday morning, security cameras recorded a confrontation in the courtyard. Capone's brother, D, walked up to Biggie and threw the first punch. 
Biggie absorbed the blow, unfazed, and took off his jacket, squaring up to brawl. Then Capone drew a 45 caliber pistol, leveled it at Biggie and started firing. 10 to 13 bullets tore into Biggie's chest, arms, legs and groin. He went down on his belly, blood fanning out. He had a puzzled look, said a friend who arrived just after the shooting, but did not witness it. He couldn't even talk, the friend said, asking that his name not be published for fear of the Capone family. He died right in my arms right there on the floor. I watched him take his last breath. Biggie was the 13th person killed that year in the 40th precinct, a two-square-mile area in the South Bronx, where violent crime persists at relatively high levels, even as it has fallen to record lows in the city. The Capones left the scene with no evident alarm, with D, pushing his brother calmly toward Willis Avenue, detective said. They headed several blocks west on East 141st Street and disappeared into an apartment building, their retreat recorded by security cameras along the way. He knows no one is ratting him out because they are scared of him, Detective Oscar Rosa, the lead investigator, said a few days later. They fear him. You have to have a gun to protect yourself, said one of Capone's friends. It's the norm. Five days after he was killed, Biggie was laid out in a dust blue coffin with a floral pattern at the Portico Eli San German funeral home on Westchester Avenue. His mother sat opposite him on a couch while his girlfriend handed out prayer cards with his photo. His uncle, a Brooklyn pastor, implored the mourners not to seek vengeance. This pain we are going through in my family I don't want any of my loved ones causing it to someone else, he said. Most of Biggie's siblings managed to find jobs and move out of the Mott Haven houses, but not Biggie, the third and most impulsive son. He began smoking marijuana and getting in trouble with the law when he was 12 years old. Around the same time, his mother separated from his father, remarried and moved into Mott Haven houses. His mom's lost control over him. When he was 14, she persuaded a judge to send him to a state-financed boarding school for troubled teens in Westchester County. But he ran away twice and eventually dropped out. Soon he was dealing crack and marijuana behind 350 East 143rd Street, a high-rise in the Mott Haven complex. He seemed happy hustling his nights away in the courtyard, selling drugs, smoking marijuana, binging on Netflix, and doing as little as he could for money, not much of it legal. He just lived for the moment. He worried about having the latest Jordans, MCM belts and being in fashion, being popular. Besides stylish clothes and Hennessy cognac, Biggie had one other obvious passion. A shiny red motor scooter. He would race around Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx, his huge frame barely fitting on the seat as the machine careened around corners. At 19, he was arrested in the courtyard with his best friend, on charges that they tried to kill a father and son. According to court papers, Biggie was charged with attempted murder after he pistol whipped the son and tried to shoot him. The gun went off three times during the struggle, hitting Biggie's best friend. Arrested on drug charges while out on bail, Biggie later pleaded guilty to assault and was sentenced to nine months in jail. Over the next four years, Biggie was arrested more than a dozen times on assault, weapons possession and drug selling charges. He pleaded guilty in March 2009 to selling crack cocaine and was diverted into a drug treatment program. But he failed to attend and in February 2012, a judge sentenced him to three years in prison. When he wasn't behind bars, Biggie would occasionally find his own place to stay, usually a cheap rental, but always ended up back at his mother's place. He worked off and on as a janitor and hauled boxes around a warehouse. But mainly he sold drugs, always with the same cadre of friends in the fenced courtyard behind 350 East 143rd Street. He operated independently of other dealers and often fought with them, the police said. He sold whatever he wanted. He sold to whomever he wanted, Detective Rosa said. There were no rules in his game. He enjoyed intimidating rivals. He was a never back down type of person. One close person said they felt like nobody really liked him. They feared him. That was the problem. They feared him. His pugnacity led to trouble. In July 2011, Biggie became embroiled in a fight with Jamal Fielder, then 21, a diminutive man from the Patterson houses known as Pee Wee. Biggie stripped Mr. Fielder of a gun near the Mott Haven houses and shot him in the buttocks as he ran away. A month later, Mr. Fielder ambushed Biggie as he emerged from a pizza shop, shooting him eight times as he crossed the street. Biggie collapsed on a metal bench, a half-eaten pizza slice still in his hand. Doctors could remove only six of the slugs, and Biggie was left with long scars on his torso and arms. 
Mr. Fielder was charged with attempted murder, but later pleaded guilty to gun possession and received a two-year prison sentence. Fielder would go on to be charged with the murder of 280 Crip member, Cheyenne Carter. Carter was being accused of snitching when he was indicted with the 280 Crips in 2014. This murder happened seven years after Fielder initially shot Biggie and seven months after Biggie was killed by Capone. Fielder would beat that murder though, and he was deemed innocent. After the attack, Biggie's moms tried to be moved to an apartment in a different project, arguing that her family had been traumatized. But she was never relocated. Once her son recovered, he went right back to selling in the courtyard, despite her pleas. In September 2015, Biggie again became a shooting victim. It happened after he accused another person in his circle of having been an informant in a federal drug case and took a swipe at him with a knife, according to one witness. The man shot Biggie in the leg, leaving him with a limp. Though the police arrested a suspect in the shooting, Biggie refused to testify, and the charges were eventually dropped, the police said. He told me, I say something, they'll come and kill me, and all of us, his mother recalled. Among the people who regularly bought crack from Biggie was Joshua, 57, an addict known as Pop Bucket because he carried a pail and rags everywhere. He washed cars to earn drug money. He was Capone's uncle, though he had little regular contact with his relatives and could not be located for comment. Sometime in early October, no one is sure of the date, Biggie gave Joshua Capone a few dollars to wash his prized motor scooter, but the older man never got around to the chore. Angry, Biggie confronted Capone and broke his jaw. That night, Biggie told his mother he had been warned the Capone brothers might retaliate. He told me his family said they are going to come for him. Capone was especially feared, known to carry a pistol secreted in his wheelchair. The details of the shooting that left him without full use of his legs remain murky. Whatever the cause, it did not deter Capone from committing crimes. Starting in 1994, he was arrested three times on charges of gun possession and ended up serving a three-year stint in prison after guilty plea. He had been out on parole for just five months when the police barged into his family's apartment in May 2002, searching for Dee, who had fled the police and left behind a car full of crack. The officers did not catch him that night, but they found Capone in his bedroom with a gun and a large quantity of cocaine. This time, he was charged in federal court, where sentences for gun crimes are stiffer. During court proceedings, Capone's lawyers argued that the shooting that put their client in a wheelchair as a teenager had left him psychologically scarred. Paranoid about another attack, he had developed an infatuation with guns. But prosecutors noted the evidence that Capone dealt drugs. Capone is a crack dealer who also uses guns, not a person scared of being the victim of another random shooting. In the end, Capone was sentenced to 10 years in a federal penitentiary. After he returned in 2012, he demanded that young people in the project show him respect, a former friend said, and he talked tough with men like Biggie, almost daring them to mock him for his disability. He's not to be played with, the person said, speaking on the condition of anonymity. It was a lot of people testing him because he was in a wheelchair. The man who was with Biggie when he died said he also had known Capone for more than 20 years. He said the Capone was quick to brandish a pistol if he felt slighted. He really thinks he's Al Capone and people owe him and his family respect, the man said. He was a bitter guy. Biggie's mother said she could see the spot where he died from the window of his room. She sat there often after he was buried at a cemetery in New Jersey and thought about how he had been murdered for punching Joshua. Every little fight, they take out a gun, she said. You lose a life for nothing. So many shootings have occurred in the area that the police have raised extra lights and an observation tower with cameras. It did not take long for the 40th Precinct's detective squad to hear chatter that Capone was behind the shooting, and investigators believed that the man in the wheelchair with long dreadlocks seen on security camera footage matched his description. Still, they waited to question him. The images were too grainy to make out the shooter's face clearly. As a rule, detectives in the Bronx rarely charge someone on video evidence alone because a defense lawyer can easily cast doubt on the identification. The investigators needed a witness to confirm the shooter's identity. Yet, as in so many cases in the 40th Precinct, where distrust of the police is high and fear of retribution silences people, the detectives initially could not find anyone willing to testify, including two people who had been sitting near Biggie. They were both scared to death, said a squad commander. Tests on shell casings at the scene linked the gun used to kill Biggie to another shooting. 
and the police had evidence that Capone had provided the pistol used in an additional attack, the 2014 shooting of Troy, another Mott Haven man with a history of drug offenses. With no witnesses, Detective Rosa thought the only way to move the case forward was to ask federal prosecutors to step in and use racketeering laws to wrap the three crimes together in one indictment against Capone. Then the squad caught a break. In late November, the police arrested a man on unrelated charges who said he had seen Biggie get shot. Sergeant Lapuzzo said he was skeptical at first. I said, I ain't interested in what you heard in the street. The apprehended man says, I didn't hear anything, I was there, and everything fell into place. Once they had a witness, the detectives persuaded a judge to let them track Capone's cell phone to locate him. On January 20, it pinged in a barber shop at Westchester and Waterbury Avenues. Capone, fresh from a haircut, was arrested as he left the shop. He had a loaded Glock pistol tucked under his belt, according to a criminal complaint. Back at the station house, detectives helped Capone up the stairs, half carrying him to an interview room. He asked for a lawyer right away. He was kind of laughing, Sergeant Lapuzzo said. Like he wasn't taking anything seriously. It turned out the gun he was carrying was not the one used in the shooting of Biggie. Still, the detectives held him on a gun possession charge, and four days later, prosecutors brought the witness before a grand jury and obtained a murder indictment. At his arraignment, Capone pleaded not guilty and complained that his court-appointed lawyer had prevented him from testifying before the grand jury. You're telling me I have no right to go before the grand jury, he said. I don't want this lawyer. I want to go before the grand jury. During his next appearance, Capone sounded nonchalant as he pleaded not guilty to the gun possession charge. As he was wheeled out, he yelled I love you to his adult daughter, then glanced at a reporter in the court, smiled and said, cheese. Capone would go on to plead guilty to first-degree manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. But this about wraps it up for this one, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.